My name is Jessica Purcell from Monash University, and I'm going to speak to you today about the geometry of alternating links on surfaces. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge the fact that I am on the unceded lands of people of the Kulin nations, and I want to pay my respects to their elders past and present. This work is joined with Evi Kalpajani and parts with Josh Howie. And I'll, I'll point out their contributions as we go. So um, this talk comes in uh, two parts. First part is quite short, it's just motivation. I wanna talk about some of the knots that I'm looking at and why, and uh, also a little bit of background on hyperbolic geometry and knot theory. So I use geometry to study knot theory. If you are familiar with these topics, you can skip ahead, but otherwise let's jump in. So starting super basic, classical knot theory looks at diagrams of knots. Um, this is a diagram over here of the trefoil. It's got these uh, bars and dashes to indicate where the knot crosses over itself and where it runs under. Um, a virtual knot is a generalization of this. This uh, is due to Lou Kaufman and this figure I've taken from a survey paper of his. Um, a virtual knot still has regular crossings, but it also has these circled crossings called virtual crossings. And these are equivalent to putting a knot on a surface and thinking of it now as being of living inside of a thickened surface. So where you have the regular crossings, you still have the diagram crossing over itself inside of the, the thickened surface. But where you have these virtual crossings, those aren't really crossings in the diagram anymore. That's just, it's, it's where the, uh, the knot runs around the surface in such a way that when you project it, it would have a crossing. Um, or alternatively, as in this diagram over here, you can kind of think of this virtual crossing as where the surface is crossing over itself, but the, the diagram is not. Going back to the classical knots, <clears throat> the diagram over here lives inside of a, a sphere. Uh, sorry, the diagram is projected to a sphere, uh, a, a copy of S2 inside the three manifold S3. So in a virtual knot, you've got a different surface. This is uh, uh, S cross zero inside of a three manifold S cross negative one one, a thickened surface. And one of the themes of this talk is we want to generalize both of these notions. So why not generalize to any surface and any three manifold? And that's where we're going to go with this. But along the way, we're going to be looking at these with respect to geometry. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background on hyperbolic knot theory now. In the 1970s, Bill Thurston showed that a knot inside of S3, its complement is one of the following. So it's, it's either a torus knot, uh, which is shown here on the left. A torus knot is a knot that can be projected onto a torus without any crossings at all on the torus itself. So all of the crossings here are where the knot runs under the torus. So, um, when you, if you think of this as a virtual knot, this is a virtual knot with all virtual crossings, uh, except you're in S3, right? So you, you're, you're on a Hagar to, uh, torus here for S3. Um, the next case is a satellite knot. So a satellite knot is a knot that lives in a tubular neighborhood of an, another outside knot. Um, a satellite knot can be cut into two pieces. If you cut it along this, this, this dashed, torus here is at the boundary of a neighborhood of another knot. If you cut along that, then this actually falls into one knot complement on the outside, and then there's a link on the inside for this particular case. Um, and then finally, the last case is the hyperbolic knot case, and this is everything else. So in some sense, most knots are hyperbolic. You have to be a little bit careful with that statement because there are uncountable, or sorry, countably infinitely many knots countably many torus knots, countably many satellite knots, countably many hyperbolic knots. So it depends on how you enumerate them. But when you, seem, when you encounter knots in the wild, they are often hyperbolic. So hyperbolic geometry is really useful in knot theory due to, due in part to Thurston's theorem, uh, also due to things that we, we know about hyperbolic three manifolds. So uh, Mostow and Prasad in the 60s and 70s they showed that any three manifold with a torus boundary, if it admits a hyperbolic structure, then that structure is completely unique. So for example, a manifold with a torus boundary is the uh, complement of a knot. 
so if you have a hyperbolic knot, then the, the hyperbolic structure is unique. So what this means is that hyperbolic geometry, therefore, must be a complete knot invariant. And this is true for knots, not just in S3, but everywhere, because the Mossau facade rigidity holds there. So this is really exciting. And uh, you could think that, yay, we can use hyperbolic geometry, and we're going to solve all of knot theory. But in fact, we haven't solved all of knot theory. Uh, and the reason why is typically it's difficult to go from your classical knot diagram and to say anything about its geometry. So, um, as I say on this slide here, it's hard to find geometry from the diagram of a knot. Um, shown here, this is a random diagram, a 25 crossing alternating knot. The computer is pretty good at finding hyperbolic geometry for a knot, for small examples. So 25 crossings is actually pretty small. In the 1980s, Jeffrey Weeks wrote a program called SnapP that will, if you give it a knot, it'll triangulate it, it'll find a hyperbolic structure if it can, and it works pretty well. Uh, it's new, it's uh, reincarnation now is, is SNAP, SNAP P with the PY refers to Python. This is being maintained by uh, Mark Kohler, Nathan Denfield, Matthias Gerner, and others. But so this is a good way of, of playing with examples and learning about their geometry. But the question that we still have, or questions, plural, is what about infinite families? What can you say about the geometry of uh, classes of knots. If they have similar properties of their diagram, must they have correspondingly similar properties of the uh, of their geometry? And this is pretty wide open in general. There are a few things known here and there, and there are a few families that are known, but it seems to be a, a hard question. Okay, this brings us into part two, which is all about alternating knots. So I just said that finding geometry from a diagram is hard. There is one particular family that has more results along these lines than any other, and that is the class of alternating knots. So alternating knots, such as this 25 crossing diagram here, is, these are knots where your diagram runs that's in, in a sequence that goes over and then under and then over and then under and so on and so on the whole way around the diagram. For some reason, the diagrams of alternating knots seem to be, they work better with hyperbolic geometry than other families of knots. Uh, so starting in the 1980s, various results have appeared about alternating knots that just don't seem to be true for other diagrams of other knots. Um, so I've listed, I've got four examples here. So in 1984, uh, William Manasco determined exactly which alternating knots are hyperbolic. This is a figure from his paper. Um, but what, what he showed basically is that everything, ex every prime knot except uh, the two Q torus knots are all, these are all hyperbolic. So that's, that's kind of an impressive result and that's been important. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, Mark Lackenby bounded the volumes of alternating knots above and below by a, a quantity that's determined by the diagram that we'll speak about a little bit later, but you get, so you get volume bounds in terms of diagrams just from an alternating knot. Uh, another geometric thing that you can ask is, is exceptional Dane fillings. So if you take the knot and you plug in a solid torus, um, most of the time that's going to give you something hyperbolic. When it's not, that's called exceptional. So this is a geometric notion as well. And the geometry of exceptional or, of, or, or when you have exceptional Dane fillings, as well as their geometries. These are studied by Manasco Thistlethwaite in the 1990s with regards to the cabling conjecture, um, also by Mark Lackenby in the 2000s. And they found some conditions on the diagram that will guarantee that you do not have an exceptional filling. Uh, and then a, a final result that let me mention in the 2000s, uh, Adams was looking at checkerboard surfaces and for alternating knots, the question of when they're quasi fuchsian and uh, Dave Theodor, Effie Kalpajani and I in, in early 2010s, um, we proved that ch the checkerboard surfaces of a diagram are always quasi fuchsian. So checkerboard surfaces, these are the, uh, in this example here that came from Lackenby's paper, this shows two, the two checkerboard surfaces, one on is shaded here, and then one is, the, is white here. Um, <clears throat> These give you a nice uh, pair of surfaces that cut the diagram right along this S2 plane, this projection plane. And so they come 
directly from the diagram and the fact that they are quasi hoopsy and this is a geometric term, um, it means that they've got so, uh, quite nice geometry. Okay, so those four results to keep in mind. Over the years, people have tried to extend this. Uh, so in addition to looking at virtual knots, other people have tried to think about the geometry of um, alternating knots that lie on different types of surfaces, mostly in the three sphere. So Adams looked at, at this question for knots on a torus. Hayashi extended this to knots on higher genus surfaces. Ozawa has a different extension. Uh, Josh Howie in his thesis was looking at these. But the idea is you take your, your link and you project it onto some sort of a surface P that's embedded in some sort of a compact three manifold Y. Um, so a virtual knot could be an example of this, say in, uh, in some of these cases. Uh, the class of knots that, that Josh Howey was looking at are called weakly generalized alternating links. And these are a little bit more broad than, and, and they encompass a lot of the other knots that other people have been looking at along these lines. Basically, Josh wanted to know um, what are kind of the minimal sorts of conditions that you need to put, um, what, what restrictions do you put on a diagram to ensure that the diagram really belongs on the surface that you put it on? So a first thing is we want the diagram to be, to be uh, prime in some sense. So Josh calls this weakly prime. Uh, a typical diagram or a prime diagram is if you have a curve that encircles the, uh, a bit of knot as in this one that I'm drawing here with my, my pen, if it meets it exactly twice the diagram, then you don't wanna have any crossing. So this is a non-prime diagram. When you have a knot on a surface, the notion of weakly prime is whenever you have a disc, that whose boundary meets the knot twice here and here, that there are no crossings on the inside. So this would be an example of a diagram that is not weakly prime. Um, <clears throat> you prefer to work with weakly prime diagrams because just as in the case of regular knots, you can kind of separate those that are prime from those that are not prime and think of them se separately. Um, another condition that, that Josh explored is called the representativity condition. And for this condition, he looks at a knot sitting inside of, uh, sitting on, on a surface that may have a compression body, or sorry, sorry, maybe a compressible surface, it may have a compressing disc. So this is an example of a disc here that uh, has boundary on the surface. And you count the number of times that such a disc meets the knot. So here it's meeting the knot exactly once. This is a pretty low representativity. And in fact, if you have representativity one, then you really have the wrong surface. So instead of building this torus and making the knot go all the way around the torus, you could have just put this on the, the three or on a two sphere in the three sphere, and it would have been the same knot in S three. So this representativity is uh, representativity needs to be high for the knots to really belong on the surface there. Um, and for Josh, for weakly generalized alternating links, the representativity should be at least uh, four, I believe. And then finally. Uh, we, we wanted to be looking at, at surfaces. So if we wanted checkerboard surfaces, which means that we wanted um, the diagram to, to have checkerboard surfaces. This is an example of a diagram that, that doesn't have checkerboard surfaces. If you try and, and do and shade in the, the regions here to be checkerboard colored, it's not gonna work out. Um, the top would have to be shaded um, uh, black and the bottom would be shaded black, which would mean this, this region here would have to be both black and white. So that's impossible. Okay, so, so these are kind of the, some, some technical conditions that you need for the generalized alternating link. But when you draw the pictures, you can see they're quite straightforward and they're quite simple. And they do generalize things that a lot of people had thought about about alternating knots already. Uh, so in his thesis, Josh Howey proved that a weakly generalized alternating link, if it satisfies these conditions, then it's always gonna be non-trivial it's gonna be non-split, it will be prime in the usual definition of prime, and these checkerboard surfaces will always be essential. So this is a nice, um, really nice generalization of alternating knots that, that satisfies some of the things, a lot of the, the things of classical alternating knots. 
So uh, I got interested in this by talking to Josh and started asking him, well, what about the geometry of these generalized alternating links? Can you do some of the same things that you do with the classical ones? Uh, so Josh and I started up a project to push classical alternating techniques to these weekly generalized alternating knots and just see how far we could take them. So back in the 1980s, Manasco studied alternating knots and their geometries by slicing along the projection plane. And over the years, people began to realize that this could be done relatively well by, instead of slicing along the projection plane as it is, slice along the checkerboard surfaces. And that's what Mark Lackenby did, for example, for the volume bands. So we, we have checkerboard surfaces. We cut along them. Uh, and then we were able to use some generalizations of normal surface theory to get results on hyperbolicity and to extend a lot of the results that had been done in the past. So that was our, our technique and it, it worked out really well. Um, so our, our main result is this, and this is a very large block of text, I realized. So maybe let me just walk through and highlight some of it for you. So first of all, there's a big, there, it seems like there are a lot of hypotheses, but these are really, they're just kind of some mild conditions on the three manifold that you are embedding your knot inside of and the surface F, I've switched from P to F here, apologies. Um, so you're gonna put your, your link onto, so your link is L, the projection is pi of L, you're going to put that onto a surface F inside of a three manifold Y. You need Y to be compact, orientable, irreducible. You need it to have some um, mild conditions. All of these are going to be holding are holding for virtual knots. So, for example, uh, representativity for virtual knots. There are no compression disks, so representativity is always fine. We do require that the complementary regions are disks uh, for this particular version of the theorem, and so that does put some restrictions even on the virtual knots. But this is relatively mild uh, restrictions. So if you have these restrictions, then uh, the first thing you get is that the link is hyperbolic. This is generalizes a result that was proved by Manasco. Uh, you get uh, the fact that the two checkerboard surfaces, these are going to be quasi-Fuchsian. So this is just like, this is a generalization of this work of Adams and uh, Peter Kalfajani and myself. You get volume bounds. So the volume is going to be bounded below by a function of this of something called the twist number. I'll come back to that in a minute. But this is just this is generalizing now the work of of uh, Lackenby. And then finally, you also get bounds on the number of uh, exceptional gain fillings. So this is a generalization of this result of these results by Manasco Thistlethwaite and by Lackenby on exceptional gain fillings. So we were quite pleased with ourselves for getting this result. We found this quite exciting. Um, but while we were um, speaking about this, uh, Effie Kalfiajani came to me and she was interested in not in, in the volume bound here, but not so much this lower bound that we had, she was interested in an upper bound. So Mark Lackenby had both lower and upper bounds. She asked us, what about the upper bound? So Effie and I started talking about this. Um, historically, it's the lower bound that was hard. So when Josh and I got the lower bound, we were really pleased with ourselves and we didn't really even think about the upper bound. Uh, so let me just put this, what I mean by easy. When Lackenby wrote his paper on uh, classical knots, his upper bound took exactly, well, one and a half pages really, less than two pages, but the lower bound was 13 pages. So the lower bound is a lot harder than the upper bound. Uh, so Effie and I started thinking about an upper bound, seeing if we could prove something. And it was not as straightforward as we thought. So in particular, uh, our, our main result is that an upper volume bound is going to depend on the three manifold. And in fact, sometimes we have them and sometimes there is absolutely no hope of getting them. And so in order to explain this result a little bit more, I need to define uh, a term. Uh, oh, right. So in particular, we're going to, I'm going to show you. So th there is a bound, there is an upper bound for virtual knots. And the bound 
is in terms of what is called a generalized twist number. So let me define this. Um, a twist of a diagram is where two strands cross around each other maximally. So this is a twist or a twist region. So there's a twist region here. This is another one. So two strands crossing around each other. And we say that a diagram is twist reduced if you put all of the crossings into these twist regions. So if you have a disk here that has a crossing on either side, then it's twist reduced if you put all the crossings on the inside or all the crossings on the outside. And by performing flips on a diagram, you can always ensure that you get a twist reduced diagram. So once you've put the diagram into twist reduced form, you count the number of twist regions. And this TFK, this is the generalized twist number. This is the number of twist regions in a twist reduced diagram. Okay. All right, so here is our result for virtual knots. Uh, we get upper and lower volume bounds. Let me, again, it's a big block of text. Let me kind of point a few things out. So volume bounds for virtual knots. Uh, you put your knot K onto a, uh, well, it's gotta be, it's going to be a, a twist reduced weekly generalized alternating knot. Project it onto S cross zero sitting inside of a thickened surface, S cross negative one to one. Again, make sure the regions, complementary regions are disks. Um, then the interior has a hyperbolic structure and in the torus, you get one bound. So here's a lower bound on the volume and an upper bound on volume. And in a higher genus surface, you get a different bound, but the bounds are, are closely related. So the lower bounds both come from what I had already done with Josh. The upper bound is of the form a constant times the generalized twist number. So this, this V tet is just a, a volume of a regular ideal tetrahedron. Uh, down here we have uh, V oct. So this is a volume of a regular ideal octahedron. Okay, so the, the, the bounds are then linear in the uh, generalized twist number. But kind of surprisingly to me, there is no upper bound in general for these general weakly generalized alternating links. So to prove that, we found a family. So we proved that you can build a family of weakly generalized alternating knots uh, that are sitting inside of S3. So if you, their projection surface is a genus two Hagard surface, and you can ensure that the volume is going to infinity as N goes to infinity, but the twist number of the diagram is constant for all N. So there's no hope of getting an upper bound in terms of twist number because it is not changing while the volume goes off to infinity. So in just a few minutes remaining in this talk, I'm gonna give an outline of how you how you get this upper bound, why, or no upper, upper bound. Uh, this, it's a construction. We're gonna build this family of, of weakly generalized alternating knots. And we're just gonna show that there, the volume can't be bounded by twist number. <clears throat> okay, so it's a construction by, by pictures. This is written out carefully in our paper, but I'll just kind of walk through the main ideas. We're gonna put the diagram onto uh, a uh, genus two Hagard surface uh, in the form here. So we're thinking of this as sitting inside of the three sphere. And when we, we build a diagram, we actually make it a little bit complicated. The reason why is we're trying to build examples um, that have to be, they've got to be weakly prime, they've got to be hyperbolic, they've got to have particular representativity. It actually turns out to be easiest to prove that our diagrams have these properties if we make them somewhat complicated. So what we end up doing is in these two purple blobs here, we put a complicated alternating diagram. So it's kind of, it's not very important what that diagram is. Uh, all of the crossings though lie, all the regular crossings lie inside of these two, these two blobs. And it's complicated enough that it's easy to show that this is weakly prime and hyperbolic, et cetera. These blue strips, this is where the knot um, twists around the surface. So there are a lot of parallel strands in these strips. So here, they, this is what it looks like on the top. This is what it looks like on the bottom. So the, uh, the strands, they run up to the bottom, they run across, and then they um, pick up and go this way. I think I may have drawn that, that figure wrong. But anyway, so they pick up and then they run around and then you come back in here. 
And then some can go this way in strips and run around and up and down. And then similarly, they can run here up and down and, and, and so on. So the purple blocks here, as I said, are alternating regions. The blue are parallel strands. And if you build this correctly, it's, you can show without too much work that this will be hyperbolic and weakly generalized alternating. OK, this is an initial guy. It's got a fixed twist number. It's got a um, fixed crossing number. And it's got a fixed volume. We want the volume to go up without the crossing number or the twist number going up. And the way that we do that is we drill the complementary manifold. So we're going to drill along this collection of twisting curves. So for every m, we drill two m curves that have this form in pairs. So the first one grabs uh, two of the handles. The next one grabs one handle twice, like so. And we just encircle in this way. And when you drill these out, you get something that's hyperbolic. And it's well known that as the number of cusps increases to infinity, the volume also goes to infinity. So this is our candidate, or part of our candidate. It's, it's a link now. It's not a weakly generalized alternating on a surface. But we're, going to, we're now going to uh, get our family <clears throat> by doing 1 over n Dane filling. So we fill these twisting curves. When you do 1 over n Dane filling on such a twisting curve, what it does is everything that goes in gets spun around n times and then goes out, so n full times. This means that every time this handle here goes in to one of these disks, it spins around and then comes out and joins up with itself. So this is a homeomorphism of the original surface at each step. Moreover, these twisting curves, or when, when, when the knot goes in, these curves uh, just follow the surface. They stay on the surface. So the surface is home, the, um, the, the Dane filling gives a homeomorphism of the surface, but it also preserves the parallel strands. They stay on the surface without getting any extra crossings. So the surface is homeomorphic to the original. No new crossings are added. No new twist regions are added. Uh, by the hyperbolic Dane filling theorem, which is due to Thurston, as n goes to infinity, the, the, uh, the volume of the Dane filling approaches the volume of the thing of the drilled manifold. But as we noted on the last slide, as the drilled manifold has volume approaching infinity. And that is the end of the proof. And that is also the end of my talk. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>